Well, good morning. If you uh, have your Bible, please turn in it to Nehemiah 8, which will be our passage for this morning. It's been a few weeks since we've been in the book of Nehemiah, so let's set the context of our passage for this morning. Last time we were in it, we looked at chapters 5 and 6, seeing how fear of the Lord working within us drives out the fears of this life and of this world. In both chapters 5 and 6, sinful, selfish idolatry from within, as well as threats from without, were threatening to, to, to stop the completion of the walls of Jerusalem. But because he feared God more than man and more than his own financial or political security, Nehemiah challenged both the Jewish nobles and officials causing the internal problems, as well as the national leaders causing the external ones. And God protected his people in both from disaster so that his promises would continue to be fulfilled through them. Then at the end of chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, they finally finished the wall. The city of God, Zion, his temple can now be protected, which is a key component in God's plan to bring the Redeemer, the Messiah, through his people. And yet the book doesn't end here. In fact, we have seven more chapters to go, so we're basically only about halfway through. So we might wonder, why, why is that? <clears throat> well, often when we get our heart's desire or achieve some kind of life aspiration, when it really starts to sink in that we've made it, we start to realize that we're actually really just at the starting line again. Any husband or wife here who have desperately wanted children and tried so hard to have a child can understand this. You pray and do everything you can to try to have a baby. And when you finally do, and that accomplishment of a life aspiration finally happens, it, soon, it doesn't take you long to realize, yeah, we're just at the starting line because now we have to be parents for the rest of our lives. Or for those of you who are past college graduation, you worked hard for four years, five years, maybe even six years, and you finally get that diploma. And the victory is sweet on that day. But it doesn't take you long to realize that now, well, you have to get a job and do all the other things that adults on their own have to do. So you are right again at the starting line. Well, in a sense, the situation that Jews are in in chapters 7 through the end of Nehemiah is kind of like that. They know that God has called them to build this wall so that his city can be protected and that his promises to redeem them through the coming Savior as well as to give them this land, their own land, forever. The promises he made 1,600 years earlier to Abraham so that those can be fulfilled, they need to finish the wall. And they finish the wall. The city is protected. And it's an incredible accomplishment, one that shows the faithfulness of God to them. Yet, in a sense, this is really just another starting line for them. Because God's fulfillment of his promises is just as much about the people of God as it is about the city of God in which they live. In fact, ultimately, God's not that interested in the city or the land, but in the hearts of his people. And it was their hearts that turning after false God that caused them to lose the city and the land in the first place. So they still, now that they've got it back, there's still a lot of work to be done. The walls have been restored, but the people need to be restored as well. The reconstruction is finished, but reinstruction of the people has just begun. So if you read my Friday email, you know that I talked there about chapter 7, which is the repopulating of Jerusalem. That's what all the names in chapter 7 is all about. Now that the city is done, the first step was to make sure that it was filled with God's people who could be there and who could protect it. Yet there's so much more work that needs to be done. So let's go ahead and read chapter 8, and we can see how God is going to start to accomplish that. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the, the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. <clears throat> and the ears of all the people were attentive to the, law, to, to the book of the law. 
And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for that purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Masiah on his right hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadanan, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebathai, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while they remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra, the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, all said to the people, to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. They said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found, in, found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in booths. For the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. This is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Father, Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray that you would light our paths through it, send your light into the darkness of our hearts, and strengthen us by your joy. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I wonder if you've ever seen a married couple renew their vows after a particularly rough time in their marriage. For example, there's a movie called Hope Springs that stars Steve Carell, Meryl Streep, and, and Tommy Lee Jones that shows how difficult this is, but also how glorious it can be when a couple works to restore their relationship. Jones and Streep play this married couple that has basically grown apart to the point of being strangers who live together over the years, and both of them desperately lonely on either side, but both not knowing how to rebuild. And so eventually they get a marriage counselor who's played by Steve Carell. And after a lot of work and ups and downs, they do reignite their marriage and they restore their marriage. And they celebrate that with a vow renewal ceremony at the end of the, of the movie. Or perhaps maybe you've known a couple who's, who's dealt with the agony of infidelity, but fought for their marriage and come out on the other side, a stronger one flesh union because of it. And so they rejoice in what God has done for them by renewing their vows. Well, that's kind of like what this passage is describing to us. God had often talked about his people, Israel, as a wife and he as her husband. He chose her and wooed her, so to speak, and saving her, rescuing her out of slavery in Egypt. And then at Mount Sinai, they had a wedding of sorts where vows were made. 
But Israel, the bride, soon became unfaithful to her husband and committed spiritual adultery with many false gods. Because that's really what sin is. It's spiritual adultery with a false god. And eventually she suffered the consequences of her actions, losing not just her home and being taken into exile, but maybe even her husband himself. Well, that's what might have happened if our God was like any husband in this world. But he's not. While she was running from him, even in exile from the promised land, he continued to pursue her over the decades, sending her love letters, so to speak, through asking her to return through the prophets that he sent to her. And eventually he draws her back out of exile, and together they rebuild the temple and they rebuild their home. They rebuild Jerusalem. But one thing still remains. She needs to remember what it means to be a faithful wife and renew that covenant with her husband, with God. So when the home is, after the home is rebuilt, the wife, the Jewish people, calls for Ezra to come out and read the vows, which is the law of God, the first five books of the Bible. And he reads, probably starting with Deuteronomy, from early morning all the way until midday, which, by the way, I take to be a prescription for five to six hour sermons. So uh, buckle up, buttercup, we're on our way. Uh, no. But as he reads, she becomes more and more heartbroken, seeing more and more clearly how unfaithful she has been to a steadfast love of a faithful husband. I mean, imagine the scene. The bride hears the vows that she had made and becomes more and more ashamed and grief-stricken over her infidelity to her faithful husband. And you know, we stand in a sense, in a position like that, every time we read God's word, every time we hear it read, because it reveals our spiritual infidelity to our husband, Jesus, just as easily as it did for the Jews. Yet Ezra, Nehemiah, and all the Levites say to her, they say, do not weep. Now, they're not saying that because she's not guilty. She is guilty. But they say that because they, they know that her, their God, her husband, stands before them in love, basically saying through his word, I'm still committed. These are the promises that I will always keep to you because I love you. I will always love you. That's the posture of God as he stands before his people. The posture of God as he stands before his people anytime we are grieved over our sin. So they finally bring this to a climax with do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of her husband is what will ultimately bring this unfaithful bride back and restore her and teach her to live as a faithful wife. It's not her guilt, not her newfound resolve, not her commitment, not her inner power that will give her the strength that she needs to live as a wife again. It's the joy of her loving, rescuing, redeeming, pursuing husband. So <clears throat> we're going to look at the joy of the Lord that is our strength with three fairly obvious questions about this text. What is the joy of the Lord, first? Second, how does it give us strength? And then third, how do we give it? So what is the joy of the Lord? You know, we all want to be happy. We all want joy. It may be one of the greatest driving factors in all of our lives. Many a young woman have thought at one time or another, if she could just find the right young man, then she'd find joy. And many young men have thought the exact same thing. If I could just find the right woman, then I'd be happy. Or many of us have thought that we'd find joy if we could just find the right job or the right career. Others have sought it in family and children and friends. And each one of those things might bring us a kind of joy for a while. It doesn't take us very long to realize that it's fleeting. God offers us here something much more substantial. It's his joy. The Lord's joy that he wants to share with his bride, with his people. As we sang earlier, John Newton helped us sing earlier, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure. All his boasted pomp and show. Solid joys and lasting treasure. None but Zion's children know. We heard it from Jesus also earlier in the reading. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. It's not a joy that we try to conjure up 
from anything in this life, even from within us. It's the Lord's joy in himself, in his work, in his plans that he offers to us. That's why it's a solid joy, as Newton put it. It's not fleeting because he never changes. And his plans, his joy, his person is absolutely certain. The famous pastor and and, uh, writer, John Piper, is famous for his focus on joy in the Christian life. And he defines joy quite well, I think, although he, it's a challenging definition. He says, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the word and in the world. That is, Christian joy comes not from focusing on ourselves or even on our circumstances, but looking to God, his work, and his plan. And that's really what the Jews are doing here. You see, Ezra and Nehemiah don't command this feast as some kind of means of distraction from their weeping over their sin. It's the first day of the seventh month, which means this is the Feast of Trumpets that God commanded in his law. And that feast was a celebration of God's provision for his people. It's a celebration that they could could do by just literally, clearly looking around them and seeing God's provision in the form of walls that no one thought they would be able to build or finish. And it's a preparation for the Day of Atonement that's coming in a little over a week, where they will will be reminded of their sins, yes, but also be reminded of God's plan and promise to send a Savior to redeem them from their sins. And then after that, in verses 13 to 18, they discover and celebrate the Feast of Booths or Tents, which was a feast designed to remind them of God's goodness to them as he redeemed them out of Egypt And then as he continued to sustain them for 40 years as they lived in tents while they were wandering in the wilderness. All three of these focus on the beauty of God, his plan, and his work in their lives and in the world, which brings them joy. And for us, it's the same. Christian joy is produced by the Spirit in us when we look upon the beauty of Christ and his work in our lives, but especially in his word. That's why Jesus says to us, when you abide in me, you abide in my words. And what happens? His joy is in us and makes our joy be complete. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. We'll come back to that towards the end. There's one more thing that we need to look at here. Because we're often tempted to say that joy does not equal happiness. And I think we say that with good reason, because often what we think of as happiness is is produced by the fleeting uh, worldly pleasures of this life. Or we might say it because if joy does involve happiness, we don't really see how that can mix with suffering and hardship. And we don't want to tell somebody who's suffering that they have to be happy. That's not compassionate. But the Bible doesn't actually distinguish them quite so particularly. Some of you might have been bothered by Piper's definition that said, Joy, joy is a good feeling in the soul. Because you fear that that implies that we can't have joy when in the midst of suffering, hardness, or sadness, where good feelings are pretty scarce. And yet at the same time, we know that the Bible commands us to have joy and rejoice even during those times. So it seems to be a conundrum here. Now I think that comes from a faulty idea that two feelings that seem to be opposite cannot coexist or mingle, like happiness and sadness. I think they can, but I think we need to understand what's happening and what it looks like when they do. Have any of you seen the Pixar movie Inside Out? Um, It's a movie that follows the emotions of a young preteen girl as she's going through a major transition from moving from her childhood home all the way across the country. And her emotions are personified as characters in the movie, joy, sadness, disgust, anger, uh, and fear. And Joy pretty much runs the show in the headquarters of Riley, that's the name of the girl, most of the time. And she can see a use for almost all the other emotions, except for sadness. She doesn't understand sadness. She thinks sadness is basically completely useless to Riley's life. So she tries to suppress sadness as much as she can. Now eventually that gets her and sadness ejected out of the headquarters of Riley's mind and lost in the long-term memory of Riley's mind, together. And as they start to make their way back, Joy begins to realize that sadness is actually necessary for Riley to be able to process suffering like the loss of her childhood. She begins to see that 
that it's because she's not let sadness help Riley, that Riley is now running away from home and none of the other emotions can stop her. So when they finally get her back to head, get back to headquarters, Joy tell, or sell, tells Sadness that it's up to her to stop Riley. So Sadness reluctantly goes over to the control panel and leads Riley back home to her parents. And Riley, her panicked parents that are looking for her, and Riley breaks down crying in front of them about how much she misses her home, friends. And she, she thinks her parents are gonna be angry at her, but they're not mad. They tell her that they miss their home too. And she hugs them and weeps in their arms. And then in her mind, there's this moment where sadness goes over and grabs Joy's hand and pulls her back over to the control panel and they both control Riley together. And then there's this brief moment where Riley just lets out this deep sigh and a little bit of a smile. Because even though she's still sad, by mixing joy and sadness together, the two of them coming together to control Riley, she's been able to find peace with her new life. I think that's pretty profound and something that we may need to learn. In the Christian life, joy in the Lord or even happiness in the Lord doesn't suppress sadness. If it does, we will live in denial and we're hurt ourselves. Instead, when the joy of the Lord and the sadness of our circumstances mix together, the good feeling we find isn't glee or excitement about the circumstances, but instead a hope and peace in the midst of those difficult circumstances. We don't find ourselves changing over into pure happiness, ignoring the suffering, because circumstances don't allow that. But joy and the beauty of Christ, his work, his plan, tempers our sadness and mixes with it to produce hope for the future in Christ and peace with the present through him. So we can have a good feeling in the soul in the midst of hardship, but it's not a good feeling that comes from the circumstances or even is really about the circumstances, but comes from God's joy and what he guarantees for us in Christ, no matter the circumstances that we're in. The hope and peace come from the joy of knowing that the circumstances do not define us that the circumstances are not the end, that God is in control of them, and that they will not last forever. The joy of the Lord, his joy, combined with the sadness of our circumstances, produces a hope and a peace in us through Jesus Christ. So that's what the joy of the Lord is. Now we need to ask, how does it give us strength? And I think... We can answer that question with an illustration of a car that might help us out here. A good car has all the mechanisms that are necessary for it to run and do exactly what a car is designed to do. But unless you put fuel in that car and fuel it with gasoline, you're not getting out of your parking space. There, you know, if in fact, without the right kind of fuel, you're not gonna be going very far for very long. There are stories of people running cars on high-proof moonshine, which I'm a little bit skeptical of, but even if you could get it to run, on the moonshine, it's not gonna run for very long, no matter how good the car is. And so it is with us. God has ordained that the fuel that he gives to strengthen his people for his calling to serve them is not the moonshine of guilt or fear or ambition of earning our own way like it is with all the other religions. And it's not the moonshine of peering deep inside our tank to try to find our inner strength like modern humanism would have us by. In fact, recently I was, I was reading the story of the, the Lion King with my boys in this little Disney book that we have, and, and it tries to sell that. Mufasa tells Simba that he's gotta look inside himself to find his strength to go back and be the king that he's supposed to be. But that's just trying to like, like trying to run a car on moonshine. Instead, God gives us his joy to fuel us and to give us strength. And if we think about our lives, this actually makes sense. When we enjoy something or get joy out of something or do something for a future joy, we can handle almost anything in order to achieve that, to accomplish it. But if fear is what drives us, well, fear eventually paralyzes us. If guilt drives us, guilt eventually leads to depression. If we think that we can fuel ourselves with ambition, then that combined with failure, which everyone does eventually, 
will either lead us to despair or apathy. Even looking into ourselves, we will eventually realize that the tank is empty there. As I read earlier this week in, in Charles Spurgeon's Morning and Evening, a selfish man in trouble is exceedingly hard to comfort because the springs of his comfort lie entirely within himself. And when he is sad, all his springs are dry. Nothing, none of those things can fuel us for long, but joy in something will keep us on pushing forward to that something through hardship, through sadness, through suffering. We just need to find the right kind of joy and know how to pursue it, which is what Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites tell us here is the joy of the Lord. You see, if this joy was something that we had to come up with on our own or we had to find in the fleeting worldly pleasures of this life, then it wouldn't last much longer than moonshine fuel. Yet, if, as we just talked about, it's the joy that strengthens us. It's God's joy, the solid joys and lasting treasures, the Lord's joy in himself, in his work, in his plan that gives us strength and fuels us. You see, it's the solid joy of knowing that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and repent of our sins, God the Father accepts us as perfectly righteous in him forever, just as sinless, as spotless, as perfect as Jesus Christ himself. It's the solid joy of knowing that we have been adopted into the family of God, which means the God of the universe is now our father and loves us more intensely than the best father in this world loves his kids. It's the solid joy of knowing that our heavenly father never takes his hand off of our lives for a moment, like a father helping his little toddler learn how to walk and is always there using everything in his fatherly way for our good. It's the solid joy of knowing that he has an eternal city waiting for us that Jesus will one day bring back with him, a city of which Jerusalem and any other good things of this life are merely a shadow of the reality. I mean, as we sang earlier, no chilling winds nor poisonous breath can reach that healthful shore. Sickness, sorrow, pain, and death are felt and feared no more. See, it's the solid joys of the richness of the gospel. Everything that God had promised in the Old Testament to the Jewish people and in the New Testament to us, which Jesus has fulfilled and secured for us in himself. So unlike all the moonshine joys of this life, this joy, the Lord's joy, is something that can never be taken away, no matter what happens, and can fuel us through any suffering, any hardship, any sadness. So, again, we first saw what the joy of the Lord is, and now we just saw how it gives us strength. So that leaves one more question. How do we get it? Well, in this text, there's actually a lot of things that it shows us on how we get joy. Too many for me to spend much time on any one of them. But even so, <clears throat> the rest of the scriptures show us even more ways. But these are going to get us started since these are from our text, and these are the things that brought joy that strengthened the Jews. I'm going to start with a couple from chapter 7 and just work my way quickly through chapter 8. <clears throat> First, joy comes from knowing that our names are written in his book. You know, chapter 7 to the Jews wasn't just a boring list of names like it often is to us when you do your read through the Bible in the year program or something like that. They'd read it and think, God knows our names. Our names are written in his holy word. This is my family. God's talking about here. I mean, think about how you would feel if you opened up the Bible and you found your name referring to you specifically written in it. You would, you'd go show everybody that. Well, if you've trusted Jesus for your salvation, your name is written in God's book of life and nothing can erase it from there. And when we really dwell on that, that's more important and to bring us more solid joy than any work, life, or ministry success that we might see in this life. You know, when Jesus was sent out his 72 disciples in Luke 10 to prepare the way for his preaching ministry, Luke tells us that they come back with joy. And they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Yet Jesus cautions them and even lightly rebukes them by saying, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, 
but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Second, <clears throat> joy comes from knowing that we will one day fill his city. We just mentioned this a few moments ago, but we can't skip it, skip it here. Just like the Jews began to refill Jerusalem, and that brought joy to them. So one day, God's people will fill the new heavens and the new earth. That is our destiny. And Revelation 21 describes what that looks like. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That is the city that is coming. We can know that. Third, joy comes from looking around us for God's work in the world. So as they gathered in Jerusalem at the water gate to hear God's word read to them, all they needed to do was to look around them, literally to look around them and see the restored temple, the restored walls, and all these people gathered who were just a few years earlier scattered amongst the nations to know that God is still working. God is still good. All we have to do really is look around this room, look around our lives, and you'll be able to see that God is still working and he is good. He is working through his people, growing his people, using his church, spreading his kingdom. Fourth, <clears throat> Joy comes from taking a Sabbath, even though the work is not done. So remember, they're gathered on the Feast of Trumpets, which was a special Sabbath day. They're about to celebrate the Day of the Atonement and Feast of Booze, which adds three more special Sabbath days to the regular monthly Sabbath days of the seventh month. That's a lot of Sabbath days in a month, especially when there's still a lot of houses, shops, and other infrastructure to rebuild within the walls of Jerusalem. And yet that gives them such great joy. See, so when we take a rest from our work and say, you know, Father, it's not done. There's still a lot to do, but I trust you with it. God's joy starts to fill us and become our strength for the rest of the week. So use your Sabbath to rest and trust that, you know, the unfinished work is in God's hands. It takes our focus up off of ourselves and puts us back on him and his joy that will strengthen us. <clears throat> so fifth... Joy comes from hearing God's word and understanding it. That's the backbone, the foundation of this whole passage. They gather to hear God's word. And so when Ezra read it to them and the Levites helped them understand, what does it tell us is the result? We see it in verse 12. Great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. In fact, later on in the chapter, all the heads of the households come together to study the law in detail with Ezra, which produces more rejoicing. And then later on, during the Feast of, of, of Booths or Tents, they read from God's Word every day, and that finishes it off with very great rejoicing. We are so blessed to have God's Word abundantly available to us in all sorts of translations, and even at our fingertips, almost literally with our devices. And yet I think that abundance has a tendency to inoculate us to the joy that God's word can bring. We are so familiar with it and have such easy access to it that it's so easy to take it for granted and forget that this is, is, in a sense, the love letters of our God to his people, telling us how unfaithful we were to him and still are, but how he pursued us in love to the point of dying for us, how he continues to sustain his bride through thick and thin, even though our eyes continue to get distracted by the false husbands of this life and how he is preparing a forever home for his people, his bride, that he will come back to take us to soon. We need to pray that the Lord won't let the blessing of abundance breed in us apathy for his word, but that it will continue to bring us his joy as we read it and understand it. So six, joy comes from seeing our sin and yet also seeing God's grace. It wasn't just the fact that the Jews understood God's word, but that as they heard it read, they saw more and more clearly how unfaithful they had been to their husband, and yet also how intensely he loves them anyway. As I mentioned in the beginning, we stand before Jesus as his bride, but one that has cheated on him and, and abused his love countless times. 
And yet when we turn to him in repentance, he accepts us back. He rejoices over us. He reminds us that his faithfulness has never wavered. And he takes us back home. I mean, what greater assurance could we need of his love that would give us more joy? We might think it might come from blessings in this life, and certainly we can get assurance of his love through those. But nothing is going to assure an unfaithful spouse of steadfast love more than the faithful spouse continuing to take them back and giving them just as much love as they did on their wedding day. Such grace in the midst of such of our filthiness should bring us joy. And, you know, if it doesn't, it's probably because we're not really understanding how unfaithful we really are. So seventh and finally, joy comes from obedience. Uh, in the TV series, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, there's this, there's, a, there's this enemy of the Federation known as the Jem Hadar. And they are this race of warriors that are genetically engineered and bred in labs to be the perfect soldiers. And they have a mantra that they say before they go into battle anytime, obedience brings victory. Christian life could have a mantra that says obedience brings joy. Because that's what we see here and what's what we see all over God's word. At the very end of the passage, they find out that they haven't been following the law of God by observing the feast that God appointed for them to remind them of his redemption and his love. But instead of thinking, what a drag, we just built these walls and now we got to go build tents and live in them, they jump right back into faithful practice. And again, what's the result? We see it in verse 17. And there was very great rejoicing. You know, we're all tempted to think that obedience is going to ruin our good time. All of our idols want us to believe that. They whisper that in our ears all throughout the day. Yet the truth is that God's law isn't just given to us to lead us back to Christ in repentance. It is. But it also shows us himself, his joy, the way he created the world, and the most joyful, wonderful, best way to live in it. I mean, if you don't believe me, just go read Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm in the Bible, and it's all about how much joy the God's law brings to those who follow it. Obedience brings joy. So church family, we are like Israel in this passage. We are the ones who have been unfaithful to our husband, Jesus. Just, and, but just as God stood before Israel, speaking through his word, basically saying, I'm still committed. These are the promises that I will always keep to you because I love you and have always loved you and will always love you. Do not weep. The joy, my joy is your strength. So Jesus stands before us, again, still in his word, through the gospel, saying, my blood seals the promises that I have always kept and will always keep to you, my bride, because I love you. I will always love you. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So let's pray. Father, you have given us your joy. What else could we ask for? We pray that you would help us to bask in it through your word in all times in life, whether hard or easy, whether it's prosperous or under burdens. Lord, that you would work your joy in us so that we might take joy in you and that it might be our strength. And we pray this in the name of Christ.